Uh, Hector asked me to speak about poultry welfare issues for turkey producers. Um, and that being said, uh, what I decided to do is talk about what butterball issues butterball has struggled with, which talking with my colleagues in the turkey industry are similar across the industry. Uh, I think it's no secret butterball has had our fair share of struggles with historically with animal welfare and uh, undercover videos. And so part of what part of what I wanted to talk about was kind of what we have done in response to those things and kind of how we want what we have done to move forward and hopefully help ensure that uh, we are doing things properly. So one of the biggest struggles um, that I'm sure everyone in the industry faces in the poultry industry is just employees in general. Um, that being said, Kate was talking a lot about automation in chickens. We have some automation in turkeys, but we're a little further behind. Um, especially with regards to breeders, which would be the parent stock, uh, like Kate was talking about on her pyramid. Uh, unlike chickens, turkeys are artificially inseminated. They do not breed naturally. Therefore, we have uh, stud toms on one farm and the hens on another farm, uh, kind of similar to a cattle. Uh, semen is collected from the, from the toms and then transported over to the hen farm for the birds to be inseminated. Um, it's all fresh, no frozen. That being said, as you can imagine, for any company that has their own breeders, uh, like Butterball does and like many of the other vertically integrated companies in the industry do, that requires quite a bit of labor. We also, uh, in chickens, at least uh, most of the quarterly breeder houses I've been in, have um, automated egg collection. That being said, that's another thing. Turkeys are a little further behind. We're still manually picking them up out of nest. So that also requires quite a bit more labor than, uh, than the chicken folks. That being said, um, one of the things which we do, I'm pretty sure every other company in the industry does, hopefully, 100% of employees are trained on animal care and being before their first day on the job. They review our general animal care being policy, sign off on our acknowledgement form, uh, indicating that they will commit to our animal care being principles as well as our reporting principles, and also any job specific training, um, whether they're working on an artificial artificial insemination crew, whether they're working as an egg gatherer, however they're working for us, um, they're signing off and viewing job specific training. They also receive additional training on a biannual basis and then also enhanced training as their job requires. Um, for example, if they're about to do a task that they might not have done in a while, we sit down and review it with them and they sign off on it before they do that task. Uh, our, we've done a lot of work with our training curriculum, making it highly specialized and tailored for our employees. And one of, I'd say, our biggest enhancements has been training videos. Um, what I mean is that we had a department, a training department, that went through and created about 20 job-specific training videos for various job tasks that are performed in live operations from hatchery to the farm, loadout, et cetera. Um, one of the biggest enhancements of this is that not only does it uh, provide training that is specific to the job process and to Butterball's processes, it also allows for the employee to see what they're going to be doing before they actually get to the farm. Um, you can try and describe loading turkeys as much as you want to somebody, but there's still, uh, there's still nothing like someone going out to a farm and seeing someone load a 50-pound turkey. Uh, before we did these videos, it was not common, or it was, it was pretty common for us to hire somebody, do all the orientation in the office, they go to the farm the first night to load turkeys, see it once and say, I don't want a darn thing to do with that, not, not my cup of tea, and then because the farm is two hours from the office, have to sit in the truck for the rest of the night um, until they can go back to the office. This way it's allowed us to uh, give them a better idea of what they're going to be doing before they actually go out there and make sure that, uh, that we're hiring the right people. As Kate said, uh, we are finding that we have uh, an increasingly larger labor force that has little to no experience with animal agriculture. Uh, before you could tell someone, oh hey, you're going to be loaned turkeys, they knew what that was because they had a friend or a family member that raised turkeys and did that. Now, not so much. Moving on to euthanasia. Um, as Kate said, that's uh, a struggle they've had in uh, chickens and it's also a struggle we have in turkeys as well. Um, as you can imagine, uh, turkeys range in size anywhere from your day-old poults in the hatchery. Uh, our meat bird toms are around 50 pounds. Our breeder toms can be up to 70, 75, some even hit around 80 pounds. That's a huge size range to have to have euthanasia options for. Um, 
with uh, at our hatcheries, uh, the, the majority of the turkey industry uses maceration, which is an AVMA approved method. Um, that being said, uh, it's all about kind of how you present it. And the idea of grinding up or pulse going through a spinning blade just doesn't really appeal to a lot of people. Uh, I'll be super honest, we had an undercover video at one of our hatcheries back in 2014. Um, and one of the things that they took on that video was a, a video of the macerator. That being said, there were some uh, functioning issues with, with the macerator when they took that video, and there wasn't a continuous supply of bolts, and it did not look good, and it was not in the best interest or the best care of the bolts. So we went through um, and decided to, I don't want to say idiot proof, but that's kind of what we tried to do um, idiot proof the euthanasia process. Uh, what we ended up doing was we switched over to CO2 and uh, euthanasia in all of our hatcheries. Um, it's not really a great picture, but you can see this is um, the chamber right here, and this is the controller. Uh, CO2 is an AVMA uh, approved method, and what they what they do is they set uh, they can set up to two trays at a time of pulse in here. So that's about 200 pulse. Um, go up here, the, the green button right there means it's ready to go, ready to run. They press the start button. You can hear gas flowing. Uh, you can't see it, but there's a little window right there where they can look in and see and make sure they see the pulse losing posture, et cetera. Um, and then they can, they can walk away. Um, the system is preset to run uh, for a certain amount of time with the gas going in and then a certain amount of dwell time. And then uh, while that happens, the red light's on. Once it switches back to green, they know that the euthanasia process is complete and they can open up the chamber, remove the pulse, which they individually examine each one to ensure that they are actually dead, um, and then uh, run through another, another batch of pulse. Uh, one of the other things that we also went through and did was before, uh, pretty much anybody could just go and dispose of cold pulse into the macerator. Now we've made this a more specialized position. Um, it's generally a, a lead or someone doing it, uh, but that being said, it is someone who is specially trained, and they receive uh, regular updates on it as well. Uh, On-farm euthanasia, like I already talked about, um, we have a large range of birds in the turkey industry, and whenever we would go and ask folks, you know, we, you know, we, we train these folks twice a year, and we're like, here's how you, you know, here's what you need to look for whenever you're trying to pick a bird to euthanize or call. Uh, that being said, we just found a lot of folks who are like, eh, well, I had one folk tell me uh, the bird looks sad. Oh that was... <laughs> And, and what he meant was a bird that's in the corner, crowed up, is obviously sick and feeling bad, but he didn't kind of know how else to, to quantify it. It was just a sad-looking bird. So one of the things we did was we went through um, using some of uh, the National Turkey Federation's guidelines as well as some AVMA guidelines and tried to make it as objective as possible to determine if a bird should be euthanized. Uh, that being said, we went through and made what we call euthanasia decision tree with various different things. Um, that helps an employee to determine, your general hourly employee, to determine if they uh, need to euthanize the bird. And uh, I can tell you this is posted on every single farm we have, usually in multiple languages. So that being said, um, we already talked about the size of the bird, and we've also got, we also recognize you need to have various euthanasia methods to euthanize those birds. Obviously with poults or younger birds, manual cervical dislocation is an option and in my opinion, usually the easiest option. That being said, we have some employees or some folks that just don't like the idea of cervically dislocating a bird. It's just uh, slightly, for whatever reason, repulsive to them. So therefore, we offer uh, other options. Generally, the, uh, it's called the KED-S, but it's, it's the Kechner device, and it's, uh, it stands for small Kechner device. And what that means, it basically almost looks like a small pair of, small pair of scissors, but it's appropriately designed to cervically dislocate, it's a mechanical cervical dislocation uh, whenever, whenever you use it on the bird. Uh, we do have a s very, very small number of farms that we have a CO2 chamber on. Uh, that being said, there are issues with uh, worker safety and uh, we actually have an issue in the winter time with um, CO2, the container sometimes getting too cold and not working properly. So we've tried to kind of limit this CO2 on farm. Uh, we do also always worry. We have over 99% of our contract farmers are family farms. We do always worry about the safety aspect of someone's 
kid or green kid accidentally climbing into a chamber and having it be turned on. So those are things that have to be considered as well. With older birds, um, manual cervical, di cervical dislocation is an option as well, but that's also physically dependent. For example, I would be able to manually cerv cervically dislocate a much smaller bird than a guy who's 250 pounds and six feet tall. Um, so that being said, we also have other options. Um, once, once the bird gets too big for manual cervical dislocation, as I said, our market age toms are usually around 50 pounds whenever they go to processing. There's no way you're going to be able to manually cervically dislocate a 50 pound bird unless you're Superman. So therefore, we also offer um, the, Ke the Kechner device, which is a mechanical cerv cervical dislocation. Um, and it actually works very well. However, as the bird gets bigger, there are some people, uh, typically are growers who are older or also who are small in stature like me, who struggle with using the Kettner device on older birds. Uh, with me, it's simply, I don't have a large enough wingspan to be able to get the uh, strength behind it to do it. So we also have a cash captive bolt device. It's a non-penetrating captive bolt. Um, it's got a little inch and a half plate on it. Uh, runs on 22 blinks, you press it against the bird's head and it pops out about an inch. Um, it provides a mechanical blunt force trauma. It's, uh, it's actually my personal favorite euthanasia tool because it's pretty darn easy to work. Um, and then once again, we also use um, a CO2 chamber, uh, particularly on our breeder toms that can be up to 80 pounds. So that being said, there are a few other options in the industry. Um, you've got your TED guns and your Zephyr guns, which are similar to a cache, also a non-penetrating captive bolt. Uh, that being said, these are the methods we kind of approve for our growers, uh, mainly to mainly to just say here's here's a list. If they come up, if they have another method they want to use, we'll talk with them and work with them. Uh, but generally, all of our growers are following off this list. That being said, whenever I do trainings, I always tell our growers, you know, always pick the best euthanasia method for your personal comfort abilities and the size of the birds. Um, if you're not comfortable doing manual cervical dislocation, that's okay. You've got plenty of other options. Um, we found that uh, as, as long as our employees or our growers have options, they can usually always find an option that works for them. One of the other issues, and as Kate's already mentioned, um, in in broilers as well as in turkeys is just uniformity um, and also uh, uniformity of the flock and then also a stunning method at the processing plant. Um, the general, what most of the turkey industry is, is using is electric water bath stunning um, and that works fine as long as your flock is fairly uniform. Another big problem is turkeys are sex at the hatchery, vent sexing. That being said, you usually can't tell until they've moved, I don't know, until they're several weeks old, you're always gonna have a small, small air of missex, sex, but you'll have some hens in a turkey tom flock. Ironically, if you have toms in a hen flock, they're dead meat, they never make it. Hens in a tom flock, perfectly fine, perfectly feathered, good processing, just fine. As usual, the females are just having to put up with the males in the world. But, uh, so one of the things that we've also looked at trying to do Whenever you have those hens in a tom flock, there's no way you can adjust that water, that electric water bath center to appropriately stun all the birds that are going by just because of the size difference in a hen versus a tom at 18, 20 weeks of age. Um, therefore, we actually switched one of our processing plants over to a controlled atmosphere stun. Um, this is a CO2 stunning system. Basically, I'll just take you kind of on a quick picture tour of, uh, of that plant and kind of how, how things work there. Uh, so one of the things that we had to do, one of the, actually one of the biggest capital investments for this, uh, in addition to the actual CO2 system itself, was we had to switch all of our live haul trailers over to uh, removable crates. Prior to that, the, the coops or the crates were welded onto the trailer. Uh, here, they have, to, they have to be able to come off to go into the system. They're held on with what my simple mind is likens to basically big, thick ratchet straps is basically how they're held onto the trailer. There's obviously more to it than that, but that's how my simple mind likens it. Uh, they come into the plant. Uh, the plant personnel undo those straps. They are then lifted up onto a conveyor, and uh, this conveyor lines them up appropriately so that way they're all in a line as they go up to, uh, up to the CO2 stunning area. 
That being said, this uh, area of the plant is, it's not air conditioned, but it's pretty darn well climate controlled. Um, I would say the temperature in there, even in our hot North Carolina summers, 75, 80 degrees, fans going. Uh, if you've ever been to a turkey processing plant and seen live hang, where they're uh, in what I call a typical plant, it's usually uh, less than, not, not that environmentally comfortable, let's put it that way. As the birds go up, this is a mechanical destacking machine, and so it destacks the crates into a single layer. From there, the crates move into, uh, this is the area right above before they will drop down into the CO2 chamber. Um, obviously, because of worker safety concerns, the CO2 is underground. Um, since CO2 is heavier than air, in the case of an accidental leak, you won't have, uh, won't have any worker safety issues. They then drop down into an airlock chamber um, and then move forward into the process from there. Uh, all, like I said, all of this is underground. This is basically just looking through a window at what you would see above the ground. And because it's all underground, we have cameras in place throughout the system. Um, there's four different areas in the system. There's the first airlock chamber they drop down into. They then go into a low, uh, a low concentration stunning area. Basically, what I kind of liken it to is it's almost like an anesthetic phase. Um, the CO2 gas comes in at a, a lower concentration, but at a steady rate. And if you look at the birds, they just kind of lose posture and look like they just fall asleep. Um, they then go from there into another airlock chamber between the low phase and the high phase. And then they go into the high phase, which is the irreversible stun uh, phase of the phase of the stunning. Uh, once again, a steady steady input, uh, but it's at a much higher CO2. They then uh, go out from there. That being said, like I said, it's all underground, so we have cameras to monitor this at all times, and we actually have employee uh, an employee for each line whose sole job is to stand there and look at the cameras monitor the process and make sure that it's running like it's supposed to. You can look at the cameras. If you start to see a bunch of bird uh, exci excitement, flapping their wings, etc., they know something's wrong and they need to look and adjust the system. This would be like the control panel for the system. Um, you can see where you have your air lock, your low chamber, your airlock chamber, your highlock chamber, basically just showing your CO2 levels throughout all the system. Side note, that's a touch screen and I always think it'd be really cool to play with, and they always tell me no. <laughs> but it's a, it's a pretty fancy system. Once they come out, the birds are then um, mechanically dumped onto a conveyor belt, and then we have employees that are orient th orienting them so their legs are all facing the same way for shackling. And then to me, this is one of the best process, about, process things about this system right here, the employee, uh, the employee ergonomic aspect of it. Uh, if you've ever even tried to pick up a 45 or 50 pound tom, it's difficult. Uh, they're usually flapping. Uh, that being said, trying to place them into shackles is even more difficult. Uh, here, like I said, literally all these guys are doing is just flipping feet into shackles. Prior to us putting this system into this processing plant, live hang was our highest turnover area. Um, constantly having to train new people, constantly having to hire new people. It was also even with it being one of the highest paid areas of the plant. Since we put in this system, I think it took us like a year to lose two employees. Um, it drastically reduced employee turnover, um, drastically reduced uh, ergonomic complaints from those employees, and then also it's just better working conditions in general. And I, I do also believe it's, better for, it's much better for the birds. It allows for a much more uniform stunning process, and even obviously we want to try and make sure our flocks are as uniform as possible, but sometimes Miss sexes at hatchery happen, disease issues happen, and you wind up with an uneven flock. And one of the other things that we've done, um, I know Kate kind of mentioned video monitoring, and we put in quite a bit of video monitoring. Uh, we put in our hatcheries, we put in our loadout, the hanging dock for our plants that are still doing uh, live hang, and then also in the controlled atmosphere stun area. What we found Whenever employees know they're being watched, whenever the supervisor's out there, whenever an auditor's there, uh, whenever they know they're being watched, they're doing it perfectly for the most part. Um, that being said, you can't always have someone out there supervising or always have an auditor there. So having cameras allows for real-time feedback as well as unannounced audits. Within our hatcheries, we have uh, cameras in all three of our hatcheries, uh, 11 to 12 cameras per hatchery, 
And basically what they are is they're in various strategic places that we would consider kind of high-risk places or areas where employees are going to be physically picking up and handling faults. Uh, these cameras are not third-party monitored. What happens is this right here is actually the hatchery manager's office. Um, and so the, this is a big TV screen in his office. These vi uh, images all go to, to his office, and he can watch in real time what's going on anywhere throughout the hatchery. Um, there's also certain people within the company that have access as well, myself being one of them. So if I wanted to, I could walk back to my laptop right now, pull it up, open it, and look at what's going on in our hatcheries, uh, which I do do occasionally just to keep them on their toes. Uh, with that being said, uh, this has also proven uh, invaluable, not only in bird, uh, in, in poult welfare, but also in helping uh, settle more uh, employee-related issues uh, employee conflicts, that kind of stuff. We also have had our cameras at loadout. Um, with turkeys, um, they're herded up into a, into a belt and then uh, manually placed into coops. Um, that being said, it's a very hands-on process. For our meat birds, this is about one of the most hands-on processes that, that happens. Um, and so we have uh, cameras, play, cameras placed strategically throughout loadout. Um, one looking back throughout the house, which actually you can see right there. Another one looking down at the chute. And then another one, which is probably, in my opinion, one of the best ones, the one at the top of the loader. Um, if you've ever been to a turkey loadout, uh, you'll, it's always usually done at night um, to help keep the birds calm and also in the summertime to help keep them cool. And that being said, you can see for about the first... Uh, first row of coops or two, and then the loiter belt gets too high to actually see what's going on up there. So uh, with this, you have a terrific view at the top of the loader. Uh, these images are all transmitted into a laptop, or onto a laptop, which is on the crew foreman in the truck. Um, and these images are actually third-party audited. And what that means is every night when the crew foreman gets back, he docks the laptop, it gets sent to a third-party company, they review the footage, and uh, audit uh, various random segments. If they find any nonconformancies or deficiencies, they email those back to the uh, loading crew foreman as well as uh, a few other people, and they can address it with that person and correct it and show them the video clip before they go out the next night. Basically, it allows for continuous feedback and continuous improvement. And then another area we have uh, cameras is in our, hang like I said, in our hanging dock and our uh, plants that are still hanging live birds or shackling live birds. It's the same uh, same process as uh, as the loadout in that it is also third-party monitored. So once again, at the end of the day, those images will get sent over to the third-party auditing group. They review and then uh, they can address with any other, with any uh, nonconformities or deficiencies before the employee comes back into work the next morning. Uh, we found that for us, the third-party review has been invaluable and helping uh, kind of not only keep us on our toes, but also keep the employees on their toes as well. So that being said, we've implemented a lot of stuff. A lot of this was in response to undercurrent videos, but it was also after we had our first video, we kind of sat back and looked and we're like, you know what? We do need to approve our animal care being program. And we had uh, upper management recommitment. But we also had a financial commitment from upper management, and that was very nice to uh, it's, it's one thing to say we want to improve animal welfare, but it's another thing to actually put forth the dollars and a significant amount of dollars towards it. So that being said, um, we were doing all this stuff, and we know we're doing all this stuff, and we're talking about it, but on the other hand, it's almost a little bit like the fox guarding the hen house. Um, we can say we're doing it all we want. We can do all this stuff. We also decided we need to get a third-party certification to kind of show that we are committed to improving animal welfare and being the industry leader in animal welfare. So in 2013, we took on the commitment of um, achieving certification through the American Humane Association, AHA. Um, they were founded in 1877, I believe, and they're one of the oldest uh, humane groups in the U.S. Uh, long story short, it's, uh, it requires a lot of audits. Um, the audit tool is very long, but uh, we were able to achieve company-wide status, and we were the first integrated company to reach this. Um, so. That being said, it's, uh, it always makes me smile a little bit and feel pretty darn proud whenever I see that AHA logo on our products in the store. And that being said, that's just a little bit about uh, kind of what we do with turkeys, some things we've struggled with, and uh, some ways that we uh, hopefully can improve in the future.